Vice Chair Member Wood, yes. Norm Member Wood? Here. Roger Folsom? Here. Elena Cummings? Here. Russ Childers? Russ Childers? Here. Thank you. Russell Crutchfield? Present. Mark Trail? Present. David Cruz? Present. Anthony Williamson? Anthony Williamson? Present. Thank you. And um, Kenneth Davis? Present. Roll call. Th thank you, uh, Denisha. Uh, we have a full contingent this morning. I appreciate everyone being on. I'm getting a little feedback noise here. I don't know whether that's affecting everyone else or not. But remind us all to make sure we are muted unless we're uh, speaking. Uh, would help, I think. It sounds okay now. We will proceed. The we have <clears throat> we have a full agenda this morning. Uh, there are um, ten items that we will ten subjects we will review and be asked to uh, vote on relative to initial adoptions, and then we will uh, cover the state health benefit plan proposal uh, after we cover those ten uh, agenda items. So with that, we'll uh, we'll move right into the agenda. And the first thing is I would ask that uh, our secretary, Elena Cummings, if she's read the minutes of the previous July 9th meeting and recommends approval. Thank Elena, you, please. Thank you, Chairman Boyd. I have reviewed the minutes from the July 9th meeting and find them to be accurate as written. I would make a motion for approval. Motion's been made for approval of the minutes. Is there a second? Crutchfield second. Yes. Russell Crutchfield has seconded that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the uh, minutes are, are approved. Thank you, Elena. Next on the agenda, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Commissioner Barry for his uh, report, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, before we get started, I certainly wanted to recognize all of our frontline workers in the hospitals and community settings that have done an incredible job of helping people uh, recover from uh, COVID-19. Uh, we've heard story after story about the tremendous work that they're doing, and we are grateful for their service to the citizens of Georgia. And on behalf of uh, Governor Kemp and, and the whole team here at DCH, uh, we wanted to recognize them. I also wanted to take a moment to recognize our surveyor team uh, with HFRD. Uh, on July 31st, we completed 358 infectious disease surveys um, per the CMS requirement, uh, which allowed us to draw down some federal funding uh, that will carry it through the next three years instead of having to come up with corrective action plans and things like that. So the team that Melanie leads uh, did an incredible job of meeting that deadline. Um, and I know that uh, there were many people that were keeping an eye on that. And uh, we had 100% confidence all along in Melanie's and her team's ability uh, to be able to meet that number. So I'm just thrilled, thrilled to be able to report that to you. I also wanted to recognize Joe Hood's leadership as it relates to the augmentation in hospitals and nursing homes, staff augmentations, where we have been partnering with HWL um, for staff that include doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, and a variety of other clinical staff as hospitals have had team members that have gone um, out on, on leave uh, due to being infected themselves. Uh, or just short-staffed and couldn't keep up with the volume of patients that have come in. 
as recently as this week, we are in 47 hospitals with 1,215 staff augmentation throughout those 47 hospitals and 78 nursing homes with a total of 308 staff. Uh, we have opened up the Georgia World Congress Center in partnership with the governor's office, GEMA, um, Public Health, and, and many other state partners. And to date, they have 31 um, people that are currently uh, receiving care at the Georgia World Congress Center. We've also developed a partnership under the governor's leadership with Piedmont Healthcare in Atlanta. Uh, close to 70 beds will ultimately be online. We are approximately just under halfway there now, uh, and they are currently serving patients at Piedmont Atlanta, and we want to certainly recognize Kevin Brown and the leadership of Piedmont Healthcare, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Batty, and others who have done a remarkable job of coming to the table to help us with an increase in capacity in beds uh, to help people that are challenged with the COVID-19 virus. Um, I couldn't be more proud of the team and the work that they've been doing. Uh, you'll hear from Jeff, uh, you know, the, uh, during a pandemic, the, the need for SHBP has, has grown tremendously, and Jeff has been doing a remarkable job with his team of keeping up with uh, the, the numbers, the people that are on the state health benefit plan, and making certain that they're getting the care that they need through our uh, partners, Anthem, United, and Kaiser, uh, which has been just uh, fantastic, the flexibility that they have shown to be able to get people the care that they so desperately have needed as well. Uh, and then the work, of course, that goes into a renewal uh, for this year uh, does not slow down, again, just because of a pandemic. And so Jeff and his team have been working uh, tirelessly to make certain that you'll have a full briefing today uh, with recommendations from the department on how to move forward. So I want to thank Jeff and his team. Uh, you'll hear from Blake in just a few minutes about an update on the waivers. Um, uh, again, the, the work doesn't slow down. Uh, several people have been coming into the office and practicing social distancing, staying in their office, but getting work done, uh, while many others have been working remotely um, and probably more hours than they've ever worked before. Uh, I believe Mario, who's in the audience today, one of two people in the audience, um, has not had a day off since March, probably 6th, and I want to certainly recognize her leadership as it relates to just keeping the department rolling in the right direction. So thank you very much for all that you've been doing. Um, Blake, if you don't mind, um, I'll turn it over to you for a brief update on 1115-1332 waiver. And then, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back over to you after Blake completes his update. Thank you. I can answer any questions. Are there any questions, Commissioner? Uh, go ahead, Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, I'll provide a very brief update on the Patients First Act waivers. As the commissioner mentioned, the work has not stopped, and uh, I'm proud to say that since December, when the waivers, the 1115 and 1332, were formally submitted to the federal government, our team has continued to work collaboratively with CMS, uh, the Office of uh, SOSIO and the U.S. Treasury to refine those proposals in nearest towards, towards uh, ultimate approval. Uh, you may have seen on the 1332 waiver, the Georgia Access Waiver, the governor did uh, submit a modified 1332 application on July 31st of this year following a public comment period that was held. That is currently pending completeness review with SOSIO and the U.S. Treasury. We are hoping to gain that approval of completeness very soon. That will then kick off a 30-day federal public comment period that will occur once that is done. Uh, we feel very good about where we are with those modifications. And again, in a very collaborative fashion, we've worked with Society and Treasury to help refine that proposal. Probably the biggest change that you'll notice is a delay in the implementation of the reinsurance program the plan year 2022 versus plan year 2021. And that's in order to be able to build the infrastructure and to work with the carriers so that they can accurately set their rates for that plan year that's coming up. Uh, the 1115 waiver continues to make great progress with CMS, and we have uh, worked collaboratively with them to refine a couple of points 
related to reasonable accommodations for those with disabilities who may not rise to the level of disability for a Medicaid determination purpose. And so looking at ways that we can create options for those who would like to participate in the program to be able to do so, even if they can't meet the core requirements that are set forth under the, the core waiver. We uh, are hoping to gain uh, further progress with uh, getting formal STCs very soon, which is a key milestone that will move us towards ultimate approval, uh, which we're hoping uh, will be coming in the in the next several weeks. So we continue to work with them, answer their questions, and uh, are hoping for some good news in the very near future. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of the members of the board may have and appreciate the opportunity to provide this update. Any questions for Blake? Comments? Blake, thank you very much and uh, for giving us that update this morning. That sounds very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. That, Commissioner, any other comments from you? No, sir, we'll uh, get right into the agenda. I know we have a full one. Thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, I'll call on uh, Kim Morris, our uh, Director of Reimbursement Financial Management, and uh, Kim will uh, present uh, five different areas of uh, where we're going to be asked to vote, and I'll let you proceed right into those are, are medical assistance plans and their state plan amendment uh, subjects, and we will hold a vote after after each. So, Kim, you may uh, proceed with, uh, with the first one, please. Good morning, Chairman of the Board, Commissioner Barry, and members of the Board. Um, today, I'm presenting for your initial approval a request to increase the Medicaid per diem for nursing home mechanical ventilator care with an effective date of July 1, 2020. For fiscal year 2021, the General Assembly appropriated total funds of 500 $67,000 and 90, I'm sorry, $576,292. Percent increase to the uh, nursing home me mechanical ventilator per diem. The current nursing home mechanical ventilator per diem is $540.55. And pending CMS approval with an effective date of July 1, the daily mechanical ventilator per diem will increase to $556.77. Are there any questions? Any questions or comments from board members, please? Here, hearing none, uh, is there a, a motion for approval for initial adoption? This is Tina Cummings. I uh, make a motion to uh, support. And is there a second to that motion, please? Second. Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis seconded that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Uh, opposed. Abstaining. Hearing none, it, uh, it does uh, meet approval and to proceed with initial adoption and public hearing. So, uh, Kim, you may proceed to your next subject, please. Okay, today I'm uh, presenting for your initial approval, a request to add a new CPT code, that would be code D1354 for silver dynamite fluoride as a covered dental procedure with an effective date of January 1, 2021. For fiscal year 2021, the General Assembly appropriated total funds of $3,381,786 for a reimbursement rate of $15 per application with a maximum of two applications per two. Silver diamide fluoride is a type of fluoride varnish that can be applied immediately to stop cavities from growing and spreading to other teeth. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry supports the use of silver diamide fluoride to stop the progression of cavities on primary teeth in children without having to drill the teeth. Are there any questions from the board? 
I have a, anyone have a question or comment uh, for Kim? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for initial adoption? Roger Fultz, this is David Cruz. Cruz. I make a motion for adoption. Motion is made, made for adoption by Roger Folsom. Is there a second? Trail, I'll second. Mark Trail has seconded that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, there, it is approved. Kim, you may proceed. Okay, today I'm also presenting for initial approval request to apply a 1% reimbursement for 108 primary care codes that are listed in Appendix 1 with an effective date of July 1, 2020. For fiscal year 2021, the General Assembly appropriated total funds of $7,192,000 $884 for a 1% rate increase. The increase in the reimbursement rate will provide eligible Medicare, Medicaid recipients better access to primary care services. Are there any questions for the board? And you should have a copy of Appendix 1, which lists all the codes and, and the increased rates. Yes, we do have that copy, Kim. Thank you. Are any questions? Uh, or comments? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for initial adoption? Trail, I'll move. Mark Trail has made the motion for approval. Is there a second to that? Crutchfield yeah, second. second. Russell Crutchfield has seconded that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved. Kim, you may proceed. And my next request is to add a financial quality incentive to the nursing home per diem with an effective date of July 1, 2020. And for fiscal year 2021, the general the appropriated total funds of $1,367,781 for nursing homes that receive national quality awards or Joint Commission accreditation. The Department of Community Health proposes to add a financial incentive to nursing homes that receive the American Healthcare Association National Quality Award and our Joint Commission accreditation. These national programs provide nursing homes with a proven framework they can use to achieve improvements in clinical and operational standards for quality and excellence. National award recipients have demonstrated a superior performance in key quality outcomes, such as 30-day hospital reductions of 30-day hospital readmissions, five-star ratings, high occupancy rates, and operating margins. The American Healthcare Association has three award levels, bronze, silver, and gold. The awards are issued annually and are active for a three-year period. The Joint Commission is annually awarded and renewed every three years. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the makeup of the nursing home per diem so to give you a better, un, a better understanding of exactly what we're uh, requesting. The nursing home per diem is made up of the following components, routine and special services, dietary, laundry, housekeeping, maintenance of plant, admin in, in general, a supplemental admin in general, which is the general and professional liability insurance, and property related. The financial incentive will be applied to the routine and special services cost only. For anyone that receives the ACHA bronze or, or is joint commission accredited, they will get a 1% add on to their rate, not to exceed a maximum of 2%. Anyone that receives the ACH silver would get a 1% add on, not to exceed 3%. And anyone who receives the ACHA goal will get a 2% add on, not to um, exceed 4%. So, in essence, we would be uh, increasing the per diem, but we would be applying that increase uh, as it relates to the uh, quality add ons for the rate. Are there any questions from the board members? Any questions or comments from the board, please? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for initial adoption? 
Trail also moved. Mark Trail has made the motion for approval. Is there a second? Second. Second. There has been a, a, a second. Melena. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstaining. Hearing none, it is. And Kim, you may proceed to your uh, final item. Okay, the final item is a request or repeal to the regulations for hospital for the indigent under Chapter 290-5-5 and to publish the amended hospital care for the indigent rules under Chapter 111-3-12. <clears throat> this change is necessary to reflect that hospital care for the indigent is subject to regulation by the Department of Community Health rather than the Department of Human Resources, which has since been named as the Department of Human Services. The proposed rules and regulations for, the, for hospital care for the indigent updates the existing rules by replacing the chapter number, replacing the department, and correcting the rule numbering and any gr grammatical errors. There are no changes to the content of the rule. At this time, I ask if there are any questions from the board. Are there any questions or comments? Is there a motion for approval for initial adoption? Crutchfield moved to do pass. If Mr. Crutchfield has made the motion for approval, is there a second? Both Mr. second. Mr. Childers has seconded the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining, hearing none, it is approved. Kim, thank you so much. We we ran through these uh, relatively straightforward, and we appreciate your presentation and know that there's work that goes in behind the scenes to make these things available to us to look at, and you've made them available in advance so we've had an opportunity to review them uh, uh, beforehand, and we appreciate that very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Patient this morning. We'll look forward to the uh, public hearings of these items and then uh, uh, bringing them up again for final approval after you've received that input. All right, thank you very much. The next items on the agenda, the five areas that need to be covered will be care covered by Melanie Simon, our Executive Director of Healthcare Facility Regulation. And Melanie, we will proceed through these as, as we did uh, Kim's items, if that's okay with you. You may uh, proceed with your first. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, Commissioner Barry, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. The Division of Healthcare Facility Regulation presents rules today for initial adoption. We have four sets of rules that are similar to the changes that Kim presented. The first set is the rules for birth centers. Um, these are found in Chapter 29541 of the Rules and Regulations. We are asking for a repeal of these rules today so that they can be published in chapter 111.8.7. Um, this change is necessary to reflect that birth centers are subject to regulation by the Department of Community Health rather than the Department of Human Resources, which has since been renamed as the Department of Human Services. There are only minor changes to the rules and there are no substantive changes. A public comment hearing will be held on September 15th at 10 a.m. This will be a WebEx event, a virtual event only. Written comments will also be accepted on or before September 28th, and the department is encouraging those that wish to submit written comments to do so via email at public comment at dch.ga.gov. We are requesting initial adoption of these rules today, and I will pause now to answer any questions you may have about the rules for birth centers.
Kiana, if we can make sure Chairman Boyd is unmuted, please. Affirmative. We would try again. You're there. Thank you. We can hear you now. Any, any comments? If not, is there a motion for approval for initial adoption? This trail so moved. Mark Trail has made a motion for approval. Is there a second, please? Second, Ken Davis. Dr. Davis has seconded that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved. Melanie, and you can proceed. Thank you. The next set of rules is for health maintenance organizations. These are currently located in Chapter 29537, and we are repealing those rules and moving them to Chapter 111 829. The public comment hearing for these rules will be held on September 15th at 11 a.m. This will also be a WebEx virtual only event. Written comments will be accepted on or before September 28th and may be submitted via email to public comment at dch.ga.gov. And again, for these HMO rules, there are no substantive changes being proposed. We are requesting consideration for initial adoption today, and I will pause again for any questions. Any questions, comments from the board, please? Hearing none, is there a, a motion for approval for initial adoption? Russ Childers makes the motion. Russ Childers has made the motion for approval. Is there a second? Trail second. Mark Trail has seconded that. Is uh, all in favor say aye? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is, a, it is approved. Melanin, you may proceed. Thank you. The next rules are for x-ray devices. These are currently found in section 290, chapter 290.522. And we are repealing those rules and moving them over to chapter 111.890 of the department's rules and regulations. There will be a public comment hearing for these rules on September the 15th at 11.30 a.m. This will be a WebEx event and written comments are due on or before September, 20, September 18th and may be submitted via email at public comment at dch.ga.gov. We are requesting consideration for initial adoption today for these x-ray rules. And again, I will pause to see if there are any questions. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for final adoption or initial adoption? Folsom motion for approval. Uh, uh, Roger Folsom has motion for approval is there a second second david cruz david cruz has seconded that motion all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. 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 opposed abstaining hearing none it is approved for initial adoption and you may proceed melanie the next set of rules is for laser radiation these are found in chapter 295 27 we are appealing them and moving them over to Chapter 111-891 of the Department's Rules and Regulations. The public comment hearing for these rules will also be held on September 15th at 12 p.m. noon, and it will be a WebEx event. Written comments will be accepted on or before September 18th and may be submitted via email to public comment at dch.ga.gov. We are requesting initial adoption today of these laser radiation rules, and I will pause again for any questions. Any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval for initial adoption? Trail so moved. Mark Trail has moved for approval. Is there a second to that? Folsom second. Dr. Folsom has seconded that. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved for initial adoption. And uh, you may proceed, uh, Melanie. Thank you. Um, the last set of rule changes is for disaster preparedness plans. These rules are located in Chapter 111, 816 of the department's rules and regulations. And these revisions are necessary to comply with portions of House Bill 987, which is known as, as the Disabled Adults and Elder Persons Protection Act signed into law by Governor Kemp on June 30th of this year. We are placing in these rules the portions of the bill that pertain to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you should have a synopsis of the revised rules, and I will quickly highlight the changes that we are making. First, there are some additions to definitions to add the CDC, which of course is the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, COVID-19 related definitions, the definition of direct care staff person, which pertains to individuals that may require baseline testing for COVID-19, and also the definition for a long-term care facility, which does include nursing homes, assisted living communities, and personal care homes with 25 or more beds. Additionally, um, on page three of the rules, there is a change to the pandemic plan um, the disaster plan that is already required uh, for certain facilities for long-term care facilities must now also include a pandemic plan. This language is directly from the legislation and also mirrors CDC requirements for pandemic plans. And so these facilities are required to have a plan that includes surveillance and detection protocols, a communication plan for sharing information both with public health authorities and with residents and staff, an education and training plan on infection control, an infection control plan that addresses visitation, cohorting, sick leave, return to work policies, testing and immunization, and a surge capacity plan that addresses contingency staffing and supply shortage issues. And then finally, in point 05 of the rules, um, the requirements related to informing family members um, and residents and staff if there are outbreaks in the facility and also the requirement that all of these long-term care facilities conduct baseline COVID-19 testing of residents and direct care staff on or before September 28th of 2020. We will have a public comment hearing on these rules on September 16th at 11 a.m. This will be a WebEx virtual event, and we are accepting written comments on or before September 18th and encourage people to use the email box public comment at dch.ga.gov. And I will pause now and see if there are any questions about these changes to the disaster preparedness rules. Any questions, uh, comments from the board from Melanie? Hearing none, is there a uh, motion for approval for initial adoption? Chris Childers, do pass. Russ Childers, I move initial adoption. Yeah, Russ Childers has uh, made the motion for adoption. Is there a second? This trail second. Trail has seconded that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Abstaining, hearing none, it is approved. And thank you, Melanie, for your presentations. And we will look forward to your, the public input on these and you'll be returning for our final look at it uh, at, at a future meeting. Thank you for the work that you've put in. And that concludes our initial adoption agenda today. And we wanna move into the state health benefit plan on our agenda. And first we'll hear from Randy Sullivan, Director of Government Relations, and she will discuss the uh, the input on the State Health Benefit Plan from the Advisory Council. So, uh, Randy, may you uh, you may proceed with your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Boyd and members of the board. 
Uh, the State Health Benefit Plan Advisory Council was created in 2016 following the adoption of House Resolution 1382. The council is composed of both active and retired SHBP members from both the Teachers Retirement System and the State Employees Retirement System. Uh, the council was created to allow members an opportunity to share feedback with the plan administrators. The council met on August 5th and a member of the council provided the following meeting summary. Jeff Rickman, executive director of the state health benefit plan gave a 2021 SHBP presentation. Some of the highlights were that there are no changes to plan vendors such as CVS and ShareCare. There will be added benefits such as the addition of accordant care rear, which assists with complex conditions management such as diabetes. Within the wellness program, they're adding the potential to earn 120 well-being points for completing the real age program. There is also a new unwinding anxiety 31 module program, which can be completed over 30 days. The council provided positive feedback about the addition of this program and its timeliness. The only question from the council was regarding the impact that COVID-19 will have on our state health benefits for the upcoming year. Mr. Rickman reiterated that the department is consistently reviewing what the pandemic means for the overall health plan, but it is still too early to determine the long-term effects. So that is the statement that we received from uh, one of the council members to provide a, a summary of the meeting that took place last uh, week. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. You know, Boyd, I again was not able to unmute, so hopefully it's straightened out. Do you hear me? Yes. A am I on? Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. I don't know what's happening here, but I'm unmuted. The message says unmuted and unable to unmute, uh, unmute myself. So hopefully it's straightened out now. Were there any any uh, comments or questions for Brandy? Thank you very much and uh, for that input from the advisory council. And with that, we'll move into the uh, state, the actual state health benefit plan presentation. And Jeff Rickman, executive director of state health benefit plan will make the presentation. We've all had a copy of this, had a chance to review it. And I wanna remind us as a board that uh, um, our, our job in the state health benefit plan is to approve and we'll be asked to vote on approval here. Uh, we, we vote on the design and rates uh, connected with the state health benefit plan. And that is our oversight uh, responsibility. With that, uh, Jeff, you may proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioner and members of the board. Uh, before we move to the presentation of the plan design and rates, I do need to present two SHBP employer contribution resolutions for consideration. These are the same two resolutions I present each year, and they represent uh, the amount employers contribute to SHBP. These amounts are a continuation of the contribution amounts set last year, but we memorialize them in two separate resolutions each year. The first is the State Employer Contribution Resolution, which is entitled SHPP, State Employees Plan, Employer Contribution Rates. The State Employers Resolution maintains a contribution rate of 29.454% of total salaries of state employees. This is the same rate that was approved last year for state employers. At this point, I will pause for any questions regarding the resolution. And if not, I would ask for the board's approval. Any questions or comments on that resolution? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval? Ken Davis, I'll make a motion. 
Thank you, Dr. Davis has made the motion for approval. Is there a uh, second to that? Roger Folsom second. Seconded by Roger Folsom. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved. Uh, Jeff, you may proceed. Thank you. The second resolution I would like to present for your consideration is entitled SHPP Teachers Plan Employer Contribution Rates and Non-Certificated Public School Employee Plan Employer Contribution Rates. The resolution is a continuation of the rates from last year and contains an employer contribution rate of $945 per member per month for teachers and non-certificated public school employees and a rate of $843 per member per month for library employees under the teacher's plan. These are also the same rates that were approved last year for the teachers and public school employees plans. At this point, I would pause to take any questions and if none, ask for your approval. Any questions or comments for Jeff? Hearing none, is there a motion for uh, approval? Move for approval is David Cruz. David Cruz has made the motion for approval. Is there a second? Trail second. Mark Trail has seconded that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, the resolution is approved. And Jeff, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to move to presenting an overview of the plan designs and employer contribution, employee contribution rates for plan year 2021. If we can move a couple of slides into the agenda. Perfect, thank you. We'll begin by touching on our goals and then move to the plan's direction for the upcoming year. Specifically, we will examine the plan options and vendors and discuss some additional benefits we're looking to add in both the pharmacy and wellness areas. We will also review the member rates for 2021 and I'll touch briefly on open enrollment. I'll conclude by proposing the formal resolution containing these rates for your approval. Next slide. In 2020, we wanted to focus on continuity and stability and provide our members with competitive plan options. Our goal for the past several years has been to ensure members have competitive benefits at an affordable price and to maintain the continuity and stability of the plan. For 2021, we will continue to explore opportunities for further improvement to our members' benefits and will seek new ways to obtain better health outcomes while also attempting to ensure we are well positioned financially for the future. We are specifically exploring pharmacy and wellness programs for the upcoming year, which we'll cover uh, a bit later in the presentation. Next slide. Here you can see the outline of the plan designs for 2021. For the upcoming year, we'll retain the same co-pays co-insurance and deductibles as in 2020. The plan options are also the same as we are offering two statewide HMOs, one high deductible health plan, three HRAs, and one regional HMO. Next slide. The third party administrators and the options they provide will also remain the same. Anthem will offer the HMO and HRA options. United Healthcare will offer the HMO and HDHP high deductible health plan option. And Kaiser will offer the regional HMO. We'll also retain CBS as our pharmacy benefit manager and ShareCare as our wellness vendor. Next slide. Next, there are a few new benefits that we're exploring with our vendors for 2021 that I'd like to touch on. First, for pharmacy, we're working with CVS on adding Accordant Care Rare. This is a case management program for members with rare conditions requiring specialty pharmacy care, such as ALS, cystic fibrosis, Parkinson's, Crohn's disease, and others. 
Accordant Care identifies members with these conditions, reaches out to them via telephone, and engages them in proactive care management. They also provide mailing follow-ups uh, to these members to continue contact. The primary focus of this program is in four specific areas. One is care optimization, which includes post-discharge support, coordinating referrals, and coordinating infusion locations. Secondly, symptom management, which in part includes pain assessment and flare management, and medication optimization, which includes discussing treatment options for different medications. And finally, self-care education, and this includes physical activity support, diet and nutrition support, fall prevention, among other topics. The end goal of the program is to improve clinical outcomes by following a care plan and in turn not only keeping our members healthy, but also reducing ER and hospital costs. We're very excited about the program and we think that it will be a great addition uh, for our members to help manage overall care. Second, we're also making changes to our diabetes medication. Two new classes will be added to the SHBP copay coinsurance waiver program for both orals and injectables. This change will allow members to obtain a waiver for these medications as part of the care management program. Finally, we'll implement an insulin down tiering program to move insulin products that do not have a generic equivalent down one copay level for the HRA and HMO plans. This means if you have a preferred drug, if you're use, using a preferred drug, instead of being at a tier two, you will pay at a tier one. And if you have a non-preferred drug, you would be moving from a tier three to a tier two. In essence, this will save our members out-of-pocket pocket costs and hopefully assist in the management of diabetes. For wellness, we're offering two new wellness changes this year. First, we are adding the Real Age program as a way for members to achieve incentives. This program targets the four highest lifestyle risks, stress, sleep, nutrition, and activity. Members will choose the health category they would like to work on and set a weekly goal. If they progress at least four times a week for three consecutive weeks, they can earn 120 well-being points. Our hope is that this will incent members to make healthy lifestyle changes in one of these three critical areas. Second, we are excited to add the program called Unwinding Anxiety, which we think is gonna be very timely. This is an evidence-based digital program that combines neuroscience and mindfulness. Research has shown that spending just a small amount of time each day engaging in mindfulness exercises can help decrease your stress and anxiety and improve mood and focus. The program is a 31 module program, it includes short uh, modules that members can access from their phone, as well as different tools that they can access through the app. Uh, this is a way that we think members can take advantage of uh, learning to manage anxiety and reducing the stress uh, overall. We think it'll be a great addition and uh, it's coming at a very good time. So we're, we're excited about the addition of this program as well. Now I'd like to turn to the member rate for 2021. In conjunction with our actuaries, we've developed member contribution rates for each of the plan options. The rates for the options are included with the resolution. For 2021, there'll be a slight increase overall to member rates. There'll be an aggregate increase of 5% in premium revenues. It's important to note that the amount of increase members see will vary between plan options and tiers. However, the average monthly increase to member contributions across all plans and tiers comes to $11.33 per month. For MA rates next year, the lowest cost option for the standard plan will be zero. For the premium plan, the lowest cost option offered will be $148.22. We go to the next slide. This slide shows a more comprehensive overview of the Medicare Advantage rates for both vendors. The rates vary, as we've stated, based on vendor and option. But as said before, the lowest standard option will be zero for the next year. 
and the lowest premium plan option will be $148.22. Next slide. Finally, I'd just like to remind everyone that open enrollment will begin on October the 19th and end on November the 6th this year. We'll be providing additional information regarding these benefits um, prior to that time. And at this point, I would pause for any questions. Are there any questions or comments from the board, please, for Jeff? Hearing none. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I took me a minute to get the mute off. Um, if I might ask a question. Trail. Um, Mr. Chairman, is the uh, share between state and uh, retirees still around that 75-25 mark? Do you mean the subsidy level? Or yes. Yes. So we, in terms of the overall subsidy for the state, is continued to climb a little bit higher from 75 to uh, closer to 79 percent. So uh, overall subsidy level has maintained its consistent balance over the years, though. Excellent. Even better news. Thank you so much. Yep. Jeff, this is Norm Boyd. I, I have one uh, question here, a point uh, that I might clarify. I, I see there is, uh, you talked about a, a very small and slight increase in some rates. Uh, I believe in past, it, it's been a year or so since we've had any change in rates and we've had certainly added benefits here. Uh, wh when was the last time we had a rate increase? So the last time that we had a rate increase was back in 2017 um, and then 2018. Those were the last two years. So um, okay. 2018, it was 3.7%. Uh, okay. Thank you. It, it, any other questions, comments? Hearing none, is there a motion for approval? Trail, so move. Mark Trail has made the motion for approval. Is there a second? Crutchfield second. Also, Crutchfield has seconded that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none, it is approved. And Jeff, thank you so much for all your work and uh, that goes into this uh, program each year and we'll uh, look forward to the enrollment period. Thank you. With that, uh, moving through, the, we have now moved through the agenda, and I will uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I, I want to uh, recognize and thank uh, the overall department for all the uh, unusual times that we're in and, and, and the requirements and challenges that you all have, have met and gone through. Uh, as we all go through a very difficult time, and, and as a board, I'm sure we recognize, Commissioner, the, all the hard work that your people have, are doing in supporting and benefiting our, our state. Uh, thank all of you for that from us. The last thing on the agenda is to inquire if there's any new business that needs to come before the board at this time. If there are none, the meeting will be adjourned. Our next meeting in August is the month when we have two meetings. It will be August 27th. And I think the main one main subjects of that meeting will be a budget presentation. Is that true, Commissioner? Yes, sir. Okay, and we'll get the materials ahead of time as we normally do. Thank all of you very much. We had a full board participation this morning, and thank all of you. I know you're busy and appreciate the time that, that you spent with us this morning. Goodbye and have a good day. Thank you. Bye.